Welcome to the WREL Daily Download. I'm Amanda Lamb. In today's deep dive conversation, we speak with our investigative documentary reporter, Kristen Severance, about gun violence in Durham. Kristen, thanks for joining us. Set the scene, if you will. What are the current statistics about gun violence in Durham, and and how do they compare to previous years? You know, Amanda, I just looked up the latest statistics, and there have been more than 720 shootings this year in Durham, and that's according to the latest numbers compiled by Durham Police. Now, that's up from 587 shootings this same time last year, but sometimes when you just say numbers, you know, you don't really have context. So we, we did the math, and that's an average of more than two shootings every single day. Now, this was the subject of your documentary, Durham Under Fire. Tell me a little bit about that documentary. You know, gun violence is a tough subject to cover. You know, there are many deep-rooted kind of societal and socioeconomic issues that play into gun violence. I mean, there is the jobs issue, housing. Many city leaders that I talked to in Durham said, look, if a people had a stable job or stable housing, they wouldn't pick up a gun or they wouldn't be drawn to gangs as a way to make money. So, you know, you can't tell these stories without getting into deeper issues. The news cycle is so fast. There isn't always an opportunity to tell these stories in the way that they need to be told. Well, we do documentaries here at WRL. You know, we have the time, we have the resources to truly look at an issue like gun violence. And so we decided, look, this is happening night after night, day after day in Durham. We need to tell this story. And I, and I also want to point out that gun violence, it isn't unique to Durham. I mean, this is happening in cities all over the country. What is unique, though, the level of growth that Durham is experiencing. I mean, you have these tech companies flocking here. It's been called the startup capital of the South, foodie destination. You have the arts. I mean, you know, Durham Durham offers so much, but you also have this gun violence problem. And so we wanted to explore, you know, why this is happening. And then more importantly, what is the city doing? What is the county doing? What is the plan here? And, you know, you made a good point that we don't get to delve into it. I mean, when we do Mm -hmm. a day story, a day turn, as we call it, we just scratch the surface. We can't get into the context of the situation. Mm -hmm. And I think because of that, a lot of people think, oh, the media is blowing this out of proportion. We're exaggerating the problem. But it sounds like there really is a problem. And, And has it increased during the pandemic? I mean, it's been steadily increasing the last uh, few years. Um, You know, the pandemic always is interesting to look at kind of how it impacts things. But we really focused on the last year or two. And yes, I do think people think the media does, you know, blow things out of proportion. But when you look at the numbers, you look at the statistics, I mean, two shootings every single day. And some of these shootings, yes, they're happening in a concentrated area. Uh, Sarah Kruger did that story, our reporter in Durham. But they're also happening at the mall. You know, we had the streets of South Point shooting on Black Friday. Um, These are happening on the road. You know, innocent people are getting shot. And that's an, another reason. Like this isn't just this is impacting the community and a growing community. So part of your research, you rode with the Durham Police and also mm-hmm. with the Chief Patrice Andrews. Uh, what was that like, and and what did you get out of that? So that was part a big part of the documentary, spending time with police. Um, Chief Andrews and her uh, leadership team, some members of her executive staff, they were covering shifts. You know because. There are, you know, many vacancies within the Durham Police Department, so they're covering shifts. And so we decided to do, well, we were invited to do a ride along with Chief Andrews on her very first day covering a shift. You know, Amanda, you have done many ride alongs in your career. I have as well. I've done them in Cleveland, Ohio, Dallas, Texas, San Diego, California. Anything could happen during a ride along. You could be with someone for 10 hours And nothing Nothing could happen. Right, right. (laughs) Nothing happens. You're riding around. You're talking. Can't plan it. Exactly. But sometimes, like in this case, it gets real and it gets real very fast. So we were with um, Chief Andrews. We're talking about the staffing issues. We're talking about gun violence. It was a Monday afternoon. 
45 minutes into the ride along, there's a shooting at a gas station. And there were this group of teenagers and young people arguing outside. Surveillance video shows this young man pulls out a gun, shoots into the convenience store, bullet grazes a the, the worker. The chief is there. So we pull up on scene, you know, and, and we're just all talking and chatting. It's kind of a relaxed environment. All of a sudden that call comes on the radio. It gets very serious, very fast. And that you kind of feel the adrenaline rush. And so, you know, you're thinking, what is going to happen here? Well, with the chief, you know, cameras are rolling and we pull up. They ask us to stay in the car. She and the other officer kind of do, um, they put tape all around the gas station. The chief is interviewing witnesses. And I mean, she's really doing the job. She's doing the job. This is not right. a, a press media availability, gotcha. right? She's yeah. doing the job. So, you know, my photographer and I, documentary photographer Jay Jennings, we're in the car. We're still getting video. The the gas, it's in the middle of the day. The gas station is packed. There are families. There's a woman holding a baby outside the car. I mean, you know, I'm looking at this happening. Other camera crews start to arrive, including WRL. So she gets back in the car after about, I don't know, 40 minutes or so, maybe maybe a little less. And she's just visibly upset and very frustrated. And so she needs to answer the other calls. I mean, that's her point. She says, okay, a shooting happens. Look at all the, the police presence. These calls are just racking up and they don't have the officers to, you know, respond. So she goes to respond to another call. And then we just get into this very interesting, deep, real conversation about how she feels. And she just, it's, she says, it's senseless. Why do people do this? Why do you have a gun? And why are you shooting each other over nothing? So for her, it even brought her into a situation, into a space mm -hmm. where she went, well, this is real. Even though she's running this organization right. and she's hearing these stories from mm -hmm. her officers, now she's really there on the scene. So right. that's, you probably saw a very vulnerable side. I did. And she was really frustrated. And it reminded me of when I first heard her kind of speak publicly was the streets of South Point's shooting. So if people aren't familiar, you know, there was a, it was Black Friday. It was a packed mall and, you know, someone was shot in the food court and, and a 10 year old, a, a bullet, you know, Part of a bullet hit a 10-year-old. Now, no one died. But it was very scary. And um, I remember her talking at the news conference saying, like, enough is enough. This is enough is enough. And it was the same feeling that when, day that at day. the gas station. Yes. Thank you, Kristen. So we'll be back after the break with more from Kristen on this topic. And we're going to talk about one tragic story, a shooting death of a little boy that really sums up the crisis. Welcome back to the WREL Daily Download. I'm talking with WREL's Kristen Severance about gun violence in Durham. So, Kristen, when you did the documentary, you included the story of Zion Person, and he was very central to your coverage. I know it happened a couple of years ago, but in a way, this case seems to be a jumping off point for city leaders, especially um, the mayor pro tem at the time, Mark Anthony Middleton, mm -hmm. demanding change. Tell me about that. So the Zion person case is is just tragic. And basically what happened was he was shot and killed uh, three years ago. He was nine years old. And he was in his aunt's SUV. Um, he was with his siblings and his cousins on his way to get a snow cone. They, they were um, celebrating. He had just been named quarterback of his peewee football team. So he was just a child living his life. And, you know, we talked to his grandmother, Sandra Person, for the documentary. I, when I called her for the interview, she started crying on the phone. She, I mean, she told me this family is destroyed. I mean, who, who wouldn't be? They, they have not been able to move on. Um, his siblings were in that car. Was who he was shot in the car he was in like shot a drive-by shooting? Obviously, in not intentionally. No. So what happened was uh, Anthony a Antonio Davenport or Little Tony um, was arrested for Zion's murder, and he was recently convicted by a federal jury. He is looking at um, potential two life sentences plus ten years in prison. And federal prosecutors say that he was a member of this of a gang, 
eight Trey Gangster Crips, and that gang was fighting with another gang, Davenport, who was wearing an ankle bracelet at the time for an unrelated crime, fired into the SUV. He fired into Zion's aunt's car, thinking it belonged to a rival gang. So it was a mistake. It didn't. Yes, it was Zion. Um, but it was was really, you know, I mean, how could you get more tragic than that? Right. Well, Davenport was a rapper. He was a rapper in this um, group called the 83 Babies. This is not some YouTube rap. This was a successful rap group. They he signed, had a career. Yes, they signed a major recording contract with Atlantic Records. And like, you know, like Zion's grandmother says, for what? Like, he had a chance. Antonio Davenport had a chance to, to make something of himself. Yet his life is over. Zion's life is over. And it's, that happened three years ago. So, so many people thought, this is it. This is the turning point. This right? is the rallying cry to say, Stop. as the chief said, enough is enough. We yes. need to do something. So what are city leaders doing? I mean, what is, you know, what is the mayor doing? What are What is the city council doing? I mean, accountability was a big part of this documentary. And we did. We sat down with police, Mayor Pro Tem, Mark Anthony Middleton, uh, Mayor O'Neill, the district attorney, and you really have to watch the documentary to hear from each person, right? I will say each person is very has very strong beliefs, very strong convictions in what they think will fix it. What I got out of doing this, no one is on the same page. So everyone very much believes in what they think will solve it, but there is no one person. There's nothing consistent. Right. And so you have, you know, Mayor Pro Tem, um, Mark Anthony Middleton, he, sa he says, look, it's not one thing, it's several things. So he thinks there needs to be money put into communities. He thinks there needs to be stable jobs. He thinks there should be shot spotter, which is a shot detection technology where, you know, you put sensors up, you hear gunshots go off. No one has to call police. Police are immediately dispatched. You have, you know, the mayor. Mayor O'Neill is this, you know, um, People say there's never been a, a, someone like her in Durham politics. She was a judge for a long time, law school dean from Durham. She has a lot of different ideas. One of them, she thinks you should meet with gang members. She sits down and talks with gang members and, and brings them to the table so they stop the violence. She calls them reformers. Well, that's totally different than these other violence interrupters called Bull City United. They're paid by the city to do that. So you have that effort. Then you have the district attorney. Yeah. Tell me about your interview with her, because I know there were some mixed reactions to that. Right. What did she say? So uh, district attorney D. Barry ran on this progressive platform. Okay. She immediately said, I'm going to do things differently. I, we are going to not focus on low level crimes where someone maybe made a mistake and their life is forever changed and they can never get out of the cycle. We're going to focus on these violent crimes. Well, many people there, yes, some people definitely believe in what she's doing. Others say it's, it's not working. She is not tough on violent crime. So as an investigative reporter, as you know, when you have two different groups saying two different things, you have to look at the numbers. You have to look at the data. What is the data showing? So we pulled these public available numbers, publicly available numbers from the administrative office of the courts. And um, we looked at conviction rates, okay? So we looked at conviction, felony conviction rates for Durham County. These are people convicted as charged, not people who plea to lesser charges or take plea deals. And looking at 38 different kinds of violent felonies, including rape, robbery, and assault, Durham has a conviction rate of 37%. That seems very low. It's very low. Wake County, conviction rate 61%. Okay. So in contrast, very low. Statewide, 49%. But, you know, Amanda, she's saying, she basically is saying the where we pulled our data is flawed is flawed. Okay. And she said she does not focus on felony conviction rates. And she basically is like high high felony conviction rates don't equal a safer community. And so our whole point with that interview was, okay, so what is your measure for success? What is your metric? Other than, If you don't like these numbers and you think it's a flawed system, other than saying, yes, I'm tough on violent crime, how are you How are you it? going to quantify that? Yes. I, I'm really still unclear as to how they quantify it. You know, she's saying... And if you listen to the documentary, 
it, you know, she says they focus on the individual outcomes, the individual outcomes for individual cases. And, you know, they believe in what they're doing and they'll, they'll continue to do what they're doing. So obviously this is not a problem that's going to be solved overnight mm -mm. and lots of different solutions, like you said, coming from lots of different people. Mm -hmm. So very, very insightful. Thank you so much, Kristen, for sharing your knowledge about this. I'm sure we're going to continue talking about this. And thank you for listening to the WREL Daily Download and making us a part of your morning routine. Another great way to get WREL news is the Morning Briefing Newsletter. It's a daily email that's waiting in your inbox every morning with triangle news, events, and headlines to get you ready for the day. Sign up at WREL.com slash newsletter.